Phil, just have a seat. Have a seat if you will. Uh, well, Phil, you're going to Got all your messages on it. Officer, come here for the city. Um, good to see everybody this evening. Thank you for the invitation. Always good to speak, uh, especially on a topic that we're we're very passionate about. Um, you know, I, I too, I, and I just want to just before we start our presentation um, from Miss Westfall, you know what? There there is crime here in Hot Springs. We 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 know that. Um, I want to let you know what we're doing to address it. You know, and we've, we've talked about it before. Um, I would encourage, without giving out too much information, to really follow the media tomorrow evening into, into Saturday. Okay? Uh, I cannot, I can't go into any, any details about that, but watch, watch the media outlets because I am very proud of the work that law enforcement has done, especially in the last three months. You're going to be pleased with that. We're, saying, we're not going to tolerate crime in Hot Springs. We're going to move people who want to commit crime out of our city, out of our county, out of our state. Um, as, as I told everyone before, the day of doing hand-to-hand -hand drug transactions at Central and Grand are over with. I promise you, we have devoted at the Hot Springs Police Department the resources, the assets, the personnel to address these issues. Stay tuned, watch your TV tomorrow evening and do Saturday, please. So anyway, really proud of that too. Um, so we, we're, doing, we're doing a lot of great things, but that's not the reason I'm up here talking. Um, we want to, to um, address an issue and make the public aware of a really critical issue that is, is facing the public safety sector here for the city of Hot Springs. Um, this is an issue that we have been dealing with for the past 10 to 12 years, and that is a, a radio system. Uh, and, and what we're going to do here tonight, and I see uh, ex-director Ruther uh, shaking her head yes, she remembers that. Um, what we're going to do here tonight is simply explain to you in really layman's terms, because I promise you I am not one of those people who understand megahertz versus gigahertz. I'm, the, I'm, I'm just a, if I hit the button, I want it to work. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got 105 police officers that feel the same way I do that when they hit that button in a critical incident, they want it to work. Um, I want to give you a story, and, and Ms. Westfall alluded it to a little bit earlier. We did have a shooting. If, if you remember, there was a shooting on Lacey Street a few weeks ago where several subjects got shot. Um, shortly after that incident, I had two detective sergeants pull up on the suspect. Now keep in mind, we know that he's dangerous and he's armed. They get out of the vehicle, he goes, gets his radio, hits the button to call for extra help. Hello? Nothing happens. I have to look at that officer. Sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry our radio system. These are men and women. These are firefighters. These are, these are your public safety individuals that have very poor communication. When we get on this radio, we need it to work the first time. So, you know, we want to explain to you the issues in very simple terms that everybody will understand what, how, why critical it is that we, we address this as a, as a city. Um, in the first picture, you will see uh, the command post uh, it, is, it is located. This is actually for the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, we, on, on all large scale events, between 5, 10, 15,000 individuals, when we know that we're going to have that kind of attendance at any event here in the city of Hot Springs, 
we institute an incident command system. What that simply means is that the police, fire, and OES work together as a team. And the sheriff's office. And the sheriff's office. We have state police. We have everybody involved. That, that, is, that is what we need. If we have a large-scale event, critical event at the St. Patrick's Day, we already have all of our people set up. We have cameras. Um, we have the tools that we need to address any critical incident. That's why communication is so important. We have a lot of, uh, of these events throughout the city each year. So that's how we implement it. That's how we are able to address, contain, and control any kind of event that arises. As I mentioned, our public safety communication issue can be very difficult and complicated to understand. Just as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want to provide you with just a very brief synopsis, a little bit of information to increase your knowledge and comprehension of the challenges we face. We're going to define a few terms related to public safety radio, explain the issues associated with our current system, answer any frequently asked questions, and address remaining questions that you may have. Let's look at some terminology. Um, defined auto quality, also referred to as the DAQ, it is actually on a scale from one to five. It is basically the industry standard. What that simply means is when transmission comes across the radio, can you understand what they're saying? Whether it's from another officer, another firefighter, or from your dispatch. Um, a very poor signal quality is a one. An excellent signal quality being a five. Um, we, uh, as, as most of you know in this room, we have consulted with Federal Engineering for a study. Um, and what you see here, the 3.4 DAQ is what we specify. So if we need to talk with one another, we need to be able to understand it. We don't, we don't need to keep asking people to repeat their last transmission. Radio talk out, uh, that is the radio transmission from a radio site repeater to a portable or mobile radio. Uh, it is very powerful, around 100 watts, uh, and it stems from a, a large tower sitting uh, usually at the top of a, of a, of a higher ground. Um, for the most part, th this is what a portable radio looks like that we carry. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is 20 years old. Right. This is mine. I, I, I've had it literally since I, I pretty much started there at the Hot Springs Police Department. Um, we have other officers on the street that are carrying uh, more updated radios, but um, you know this has a very low transmission rate compared to a mobile radio located in a, in a police vehicle or mounted in a fire truck. The radio talk-in. Um, Essentially what that is, that's the um, portable or mobile unit's ability to broadcast to a radio site from any given location. Um, they, they broadcast at, at low power for 3 watts for a portable, 35 watts at a mobile. So here's what, here's what we asked from Federal Engineering, our consultant. We, we explained to them that we expect you to give us a proposal that meets the industry standard. And that industry standard is 95% for portable radios and 97% for, for mobile radios. That, that is the, the current industry standard for radios. So right now, so you may ask, what, what, what do we have? What kind of coverage do we currently have in the city of Hot Springs? Um, approximately 80 to 85 percent, give or take. Um, there, there, are, there are several infrastructures, which we'll discuss later, that you can't, you can't get out at all. So um, very, very, very poor, poor service. Trunk radio system, it essentially works as a Li-Fi design. Um, it, it basically sends out a net, so if, if you're in a line of sight from that tower to that radio, you're going to be able to receive that transmission. Um, 
one of the things that really talk about the advent of technology, the difference between a, a new radio system, the new technology of today compared to what it was 20 years ago, we've got circuit boards, we've got, it's more hardware driven. There, there's a lot of different actual hardware components that goes into our current radio systems. As of today, it pretty much, in, in chief, from, from what we understand, much more, software much more software driven. In other words, you get a disk, you can put it in the CPU, it works over that voice over internet protocol. I mean, it has that ability. It is more software, has a whole lot less uh, issues that can obviously go wrong. Here is a, a side map of the trunk radio system. Um, we are uh, proposing, or federal engineering has proposed four radio towers for the city. Um, one of them being, um, and, and Chief, go ahead, you can go ahead and... Well, the, the four sites that they're proposing are West Mountain, uh, Fernwood near Lakeside, uh, Mount Leonte, and then uh, up top of the ridge line above Fox Pass. All of these sites uh, are pre-engineered. There are already cell towers on these sites. They're all, all developed, all capable of actually supporting the operation of uh, a, uh, a voice over internet protocol radio system. Um, you know, in, in the, these systems are kind of complicated. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of things that go on, um, you know, within microseconds. In other words, there would be a, a signal that would be sent out from a radio like this that would actually go back to a controller, and, and that controller would tell it, what channel to be on, uh, you know, what tower to be on, it would all do it in just a, a fraction of a second. So fast you wouldn't realize it's actually happening. And what that would guarantee us, the officer in the field, or the firefighter in the field, they would have the best possible communications about the local location into that. In other words, it would pick the best tower, it would pick the, uh, the best channel uh, for the clearest, crispest storm. <coughs> Bidirectional amplifiers, uh, that is just simply a device. Um, there, there are several buildings uh, in the downtown area right now um, that, that if police or fire, if they walk into, we have no reception whatsoever. Um, a bidirectional amplifier is a possible solution to those buildings. We're hoping um, if we can get a radio system built and operational, that will limit those number of buildings and infrastructures that will require a bi-directional amplifier. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, we can utilize those, especially in some of the older buildings that we have very poor reception, um, but that is a, a, a possible option for us. So here's some of the problems we talked about. Police and fire radios are, are near the end of their life. Um, if, if I drop this radio right now, and if it, should, if, if it falls apart, which it may, um, there's no replacement parts for it. It's, it's, that's just the reality. They don't make replacement parts for, for our radios uh, in our console any longer. Um, we, both, we all suffer from very poor broadcast quality and coverage issues. Um, and, and right now, if, if we're at a scene together like what we were an hour ago. Uh, we were standing at, at a critical event. Um, if I got away from Chief Davis, my radio can't talk to his radio. So we, we don't have that luxury of interoperability at all. As the police department, uh, of the 338 radios in use, more than 63% have surpassed their end of support date. It can only be repaired if parts are available. So I'll give you a funny story. We had a, 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 a part break uh, up at our tower site. And so we were, we were just very alarmed that, you know, maybe, you know, they could not bring our tower site uh, back up. And so uh, one, of the, one of the supervisors came to me and he says, Oh my gosh, Chief, you're not going to believe this. We, we actually got it back up and running. And um, I, I said, well, I mean, how in the world did he, did he find the, the piece of equipment? He said, he made one. He, he made wow. it. He, he actually took a couple boards and soldered them back together and actually got us up and running. So um, luckily that we've got um, a pretty good couple of technicians that work with us. 
So this is a microprocessor. Uh, I, I promised you a year ago, two years ago, I would not know what that device is. Uh, uh, but, but how many of you remember back in the 80s, those Sega, you know, those games that maybe uh, you played on, your kids played on, you remember those? Yep. Okay, uh, yes, the, I do. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Commodore, the Commodore 64. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> that's an 8-bit processor. That, that's what powered those devices up. That's what we have in our radios today. That's what controls your system. That's 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 what controls our system. Now you can still maybe find this microprocessor, maybe on eBay. Um, but technically, most manufacturers are very lowest. Uh, processor that they made to the 32-bit. So this right here is a coverage map. This, this is the proposed coverage area by federal engineering. This will show um, our talk-in, talk-out for both portable and mobile radios. Um, the green in the city, throughout the city, shows coverage areas. There is really the only area that you don't you don't really have or, or you have difficulty is that area behind Music Mountain. Uh, that is right there along that Bull Bayou corridor. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, there is a, that ridge there. So that is pretty much the only area that we're going to um, see any kind of um, any effects from. But we've got this proposed um, map with the four tower sites gives us excellent coverage especially in our critical infrastructures. So what are you considering critical infrastructures? Schools, where your kids and your grandkids go, mm -hmm. hospitals, nursing homes. Um, the, these are your critical infrastructures, and it will give us the covers that we need to address any kind of threat or critical events in, um, at these locations. The red and the blue boxes were areas that the police and fire identified prior to this and told our radio consultants, these are where we're having problems at. Um, one of those locations um, obviously is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but is this not the Lakeside School area? Yeah. This is the Lakeside School area. So that, that remedies uh, that issue out at Lakeside. So, very, very great coverage. Um, Just as important to point out the green is a DAQ of 3.4 for the portable radio. The, the yellow areas underneath that are areas that the DAQ would be less than that on a portable, but it would still be at least a 3.4 DAQ for all mobile radios that we could preside for this cause of Okay. Did everyone hear that? About remember how we talked about the DAQ earlier? About if you can actually understand the message. So um, everybody remembers the Majestic Fire, that was a very long 72 hour operation. Um, I was there, Chief Davis was there. Um, it, it, it went back to, to what I, I discussed earlier. We don't have interoperability. We did not have interoperability at the Majestic Fire. That's why we had to stand next to each other with two different sets of radios to relay important information to, the, to our officers or firefighters if we needed to to put that out. Something else that happened at this majestic fire that is, is very noteworthy, very important, is that the, uh, Chief Davis's radio system was utilized for a continuous 72 hour period. Now what does that mean? His system is only, was only built to, to have transmissions go across the, the airwaves 50, is it 50 seconds out of every 100 seconds? So it's only a, a halfway design, it's only, the system's only designed for half use. So when you had 72 hours of full around the clock coverage, guess what do you think, it, what do you think happened? Anybody have any idea? Yes ma'am, that's exactly right. It went down, it essentially burned up. It got very hot and, and that is still an issue to this day thus far. Um, it, it, it has never fully recovered at all. <laughs> so why do we need to do radio systems? As we talked about, our, our current system is 20 years old. 
They no longer make any replacement parts. Um, you know, it's just it's just a worn out system. It's it's, it's old. It's antiquated um, technology. Um, they're very. Um, we have a lot of interference. A lot of the transmissions you can't understand. Um, so that that is some of the issues. So there there are different needs uh, between. Uh, fire and police uh, versus the city of Jefferson <coughs> County. Um, you know, there obviously we, we have um, a certain, some problems that maybe the county does not face and vice versa. So we need a radio system that's going to address the needs of an urban environment. Um, and we are going to maintain that 95% performance coverage for our public safety communication system. Let me ask you this, I'm a parent, would I want a system that says, oh, you don't need a 95% if they're the police or fire. You know what, I think 80%. Really? To protect my own kids? Would you no. do that? No. No, none of us would. Absolutely not. So, one power site is not enough, and a lot of that is basically because of the topography. We live in a boat. We're surrounded by mountains. And we have got to have those four tower sites to adequately cover the city of Hot Springs. Uh, we've got some ridge lines, and, and so we have to make sure that um, it's well covered. You remember we talked about bidirectional amplifiers? This will not solve the problem in and by itself. It is a good tool. Uh, but it is not the uh, end-all, save-all for our radio system. But they can enhance some buildings that we have uh, trouble getting out of. So, uh, let's see here. Here's the main thing, and here's, what, here's a very important topic. We've got to have interoperability, whether it's with the police and the sheriff's department, the police and fire, um, we, we have got to be able, every agency has to be able to communicate with the other. This proposed radio system would allow for that interoperability to take place. So here's the radio system proposal comparison. The current federal study on the left versus the 2013 countywide study. Um, you can see pretty much the difference. Uh, the federal study uh, currently shows a portable talk out of 95%, mobile talk out of 97. Um, the cost uh, for all city departments at the $8.4 million range compared to 2013. Uh, the difference in the talk out, portable and mobile radio, and also the cost being significantly a whole lot more for just public safety duties only. It's important to note though that this system is designed to, to cover the city of Hot Springs and the River Valley. The 2013 proposal was designed to, to give countywide coverage at a certain level. Uh, so there are differences in the system. But we wanted to put them up there to show a comparison between the two. We knew people would ask questions about it. And if you don't have to take pictures, we'll be happy to give you a copy of it if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So I'm going to stop here, um, and I'm going to turn this over to our, our awesome city manager, Mr. David Frazier. <laughs> yeah, so I, I get to talk about the fun part, which is how to pay for this. And, uh, you know, we're getting ready to do our first, I'm getting ready to do my first budget on behalf of the city. And, uh, you know, our numbers are, are better. They're improving. Uh, last year, I wasn't here for the budget process, but I can tell you because of health care costs, we, we basically, we had a budget that might have been balanced on paper, but it had a structural deficit in it. And I would say that deficit was around 800000 So we've done some things with health care that I think uh, we're about to, the board is going to be wrestling with the, these decisions. But uh, the work that the committee has done, we had a health care committee studying this for the last six months. And we are about to recommend a new health care provider, a new third-party administrator, and those two decisions will 
save us upwards of 400,000 a year, and it could be quite a bit higher than that. So, is it going to be self-funded still? Yes, it's self-funded. Because uh, our self-funded system, this is, by the way, by admission, the first time I've worked with a self-funded system, all of the other cities I've managed had premiums that they paid. Somebody else did all the work and took all the risk. Uh, our premiums in the last city I managed were about $1,700 for a family premium, and here at Hot Springs it's, you know, hundreds less than that. So you're still, even though you've had a bad year, we had a lot of people get we had a handful of people get sick and had really high claims history in the past 12 months. And I don't think our third party administrator, frankly, did a great job of uh, controlling costs and keeping us abreast of how it was being utilized. We had some loopholes in our system, for example, that allowed people to go to the ER and get procedures that any of us would never think of going to the ER for. Stents in your heart, for example, uh, that could have been done in an outpatient or could have been done with regular hospital scheduling. Uh, ER costs, as you know, are a lot higher. So we had we had those problems in our system that have been fixed, but uh, the real savings and that kind of I hate to say this phrase, but it sort of stopped the bleeding, if you will, in our healthcare expenditures uh, during this year. But it didn't do much to think in the future years. It closed those loopholes, but we still had a structural deficit in our budget. So <clears throat> between the board has made a couple of decisions that affected our general fund revenues uh, to the tune of about eight hundred thousand more. And then if you save another 400000 uh, what I'm telling you is in this budget that I'm going to propose, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure there's no structural deficit. I don't know that uh, it'll, it probably isn't going to address the concern you raised uh, about the long-term police and fire pension liability, um, but it's going to address the structural deficit that is in health care. So, um, so the, the, let me see, I don't even know what the next slide looks like. It's a second uh, to say how will we pay for it. Yeah. <coughs> how will we pay for it? And see, these guys did this slide and I haven't seen it. So it's good. We know what I know what we talked about. So this is gonna be fun for all of us. He hopes it's in. I, I don't know if you guys set me up or not. <laughs> so uh, for probably six million dollars we can now I want you to know that our consultant with federal engineering, they estimated the cost of these improvements that the, the that the chiefs talked about tonight. At much higher. There was a there's a substantial contingency in there because a consultant doesn't want to be wrong. He wants to be conservative. So they put a contingency in there that I thought was a little too robust. So both the chiefs and I have sat down and sharpened the pencils, and we believe that for six million dollars we can fix this system, which is going to be about two million less than the consultant predicted. <clears throat> also, I want to mention that um, so. Half of this money, about half of this system is going to have to be paid for by the general fund, but because we have a large utility system and a lot of those employees on that utility system use this, so about half of it will be paid for with our utilities existing funds. The other half has to be paid for from general fund, and that's where it's hard to find money without cutting services. Um, before I get off this, uh, when I when I fix things, one of the things I pride myself in as a uh, credential city managers, when I go to the board with a recommendation to fix something, I think one of the reasons that sometimes local government doesn't have trust from the public the way it should is when we fix things, we tend to, we react to some emotional thing and we fix a temporary thing. We have a long-term problem, but we put a temporary fix on it. So I want to give you an example. One of my pledges here is when I tell the board this is going to fix something, I'm also at the same time going to direct our finance department to set up a separate account where we basically have a radio system replacement fund. Uh, I think one of the candidates who was up here said, well, the city's known about this for a decade and they didn't save any money. So I want to make sure that we set aside a separate account that's only for radio replacement so that every single year we're putting a little bit of money in there, a little bit of money in there. because. We all know 20 years from now, whatever technology we're using now is going to be obsolete, probably in 10 years. So I just don't want, I want you to know that when we make a recommendation, we're also trying to look way down the road, several elections away from now, because people here, I think, deserve that kind of planning. And so we're going to try to do that. So um, this is one way of paying for it, right? So um, about half the system's cost, again, will be derived from a millage. Um, to about 2.6 mills would yield 1.5 million in revenue for two years. So if you had a 2.6% millage 
for two years, you can pay for this system. Um, Judge Davis is here, and I want to want to thank him because he's been kind of a collaborating partner in us talking about our radio systems and how to make sure they're interoperable. But one of the challenges we both face is where to find the money to fix these things. And our general fund provides a lot of services that people want. They provide police and fire and basic services that I don't hear a clamoring for less of. What I usually hear general fund services, people want more of it. You know, why don't we have more of this, more of that? Can you send more people? Can you do more things? And it's very hard to do more things with a general fund because you're very limited here. We have only really one source of revenue. Uh, right now, which is sales tax. So, a two year temporary millage could pay for this radio system. That's one of the options. Uh oh. Um, you didn't say that. <laughs> so, but we want to take questions from you guys. We also would like to have your ideas. If somebody here says, hey, have you thought about funding it this way or that way? We're, we're all, I got big ears, and we're here to listen. Is the millage tax you're proposing one that's going to be put in front of the people, or will it be a board? It's a board decision whether or not to do that. Um, but I, I, you know, I would, I would tell you though, there's two different kinds of decisions that I see that the board makes or that the public has to make. And and how do I say this? One one of these one one type of decision is what I call a values based decision. It would be, um, do we build a new soccer field or do we build a swimming pool? Do we paint the school gymnasium or do we pave the street? Those are values-based decisions for which there's not a right or wrong answer. It's, it's really what you prefer. Do you value this more than that? Do you want more parks? Do you want better streets? Those are values-based decisions that, to me, oftentimes the public knows. You guys know these things. They're common sense things. You drive your car on the streets, right? You, you go to the park and you, see, you either see a nice park or you just see weeds like this. And you have enough information to make that decision. And, it's not a technical decision like this one. Those values-based decisions, often uh, public bodies will decide to ask the public to vote on those because their information is readily available. And if you say no, if the public says no, we don't want that, no one gets killed. It's OK. You don't have to have it. Public safety decisions are a different class of decisions. And so in that case, often you'll see um, public bodies decide to exercise their, their authority and their obligation, in many cases, to study the issues. This thing uh, comes with a packet this thick. There's this federal engineering study, and I didn't see the other one. But it's very technical, right? And so you're in there, and the assumption is that your elected officials read that, they study it, they go over it. Your experts study it, they go over it, they try to minimize the cost. Uh, and so it's a technical decision. It's a very heavy on technical. Uh, it's also, being a public safety decision, it's, it's a lot like, I'll give you another example of a public safety decision. The night the Majestic caught fire, we spent a quarter million dollars in extra costs, overtime, facilities, equipment, putting out a fire. We didn't go to a vote, we had to go. We made the decision because it was a life safety decision. And this isn't quite a fire burning, but if you go to Lakeside School and see what I saw in some of the field trips we went down there, it, it is. We have a shopping mall. We have these places where they're what we would call high target areas. They're either areas where we're likely to have active shooters. There are hotels that we already know from experience burn. Uh, if there's a disturbance at the check-in counter at the Arlington, there's no coverage. It's not a little bit. It's not scratchy. It's not some. Sometimes we hear. Sometimes you. It's zero. That's the coverage. In Lakeside School, you walk in there, there's big glass doors. You walk past there, you walk 10 feet inside the door. There's no coverage. And I was in there the day these guys took me out there. I had a three and a half year old daughter. I don't want to get emotional, but she's going to go to Lakeside if I'm still here. And I'm looking around at a thousand of these little trusting souls who are looking at us to protect them, and there's no coverage. It's not a little bit, it's not kind of, it's a zero. If we have an active shooter there, we're going to be on national news, but it ain't going to be pretty. It's, it's, so so when, I, when I say, maybe the board should make this call, that's all I'm saying, because it's a public safety decision. It's not a values-based decision. It's very different. And, you know, it just depends on how much risk you're willing to take. Some would say, you know, it's been like this for 10 years and we haven't had a crisis. Maybe it's okay. 
but the nature of the decision you ask people. Then the third thing I would say is if, if I ask somebody if they want to vote on something and they tell me what they want and don't want, you really want to be able to honor that. So if they say, for example, we don't want to fix a radio system, we still have to fix a radio system. You know, we can't, we can't, we heard you, we don't have to paint the gym and we don't have to build a new park, but we still have fix this. We have men and women out there every day at risk. And we have citizens and visitors and kids, our most vulnerable citizens out there at risk. So if the public says don't fix it, we still have to fix it. So, you know, those are all things that our board is going to have to wrestle with when they make the decision. And all I would tell you is, it's not going to be easy. I'm sure they would rather say, yeah, everybody vote on everything. But sometimes you have to study, you have to represent the people, you have to do your best to make your best judgment and do what's hard. These guys work uh, on our board for free. <laughs> They're running for a very hard job to do for free and just for the opportunity of making a decision like this. And it's not, it's not an easy one, but those are just some of the things you got to think about. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to congratulate both the fire department and the police department because I've been recipient of both of their services in my neighborhood. When I first moved in, there was a lot of drug activity, meth labs and stuff, and we cleaned them out. All my neighbors and I got together, and with the police, we cleared them out. And uh, I had a friend stay the night when she was moving from the village to Austin. And she forgot to lock her car, which was packed with all her stuff, the hall of Austin, on the street. Nobody disturbed it. Because we have a neighborhood who cares. We've made police yeah. work with us. And I <coughs> had it. On the other street now, I'm not responsible for They set fire to the garage behind me, burned my storage down. And the police came and told me to get the hell out of my house. <laughs> So I owe both you guys a lot. You guys well, thank you. Thank time. you so much. Right, yes, ma'am. I'd like to suggest, recommend, or really like to demand that the city do away with the Hananaki junkets and put that money towards taking care of our firemen and police. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know how, I don't know much about that, frankly. I've never been to Hanamaki and I wasn't here when they did. Well, they do it quite like this. Yeah, I know there's a sister city program, but, but I just have to tell you the amount of money we're talking about here and the amount they spend there. It's, it's still know. something that can be added to the county. Okay, I, I appreciate knowing that. I'll think, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we just voted ourselves a four mil increase in school tax. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> We've got a high poverty level in the city. Yeah. I mean, there's something that was called a lot of folks about the uh, school, how many kids are on school lunches. Now we're going to have, and I don't care if they're renters, their landlords will pay, it will make their rent go up. Yes. Uh, has anybody ever thought of asking the people, have bake sales, have fairs to come support the police, and get them radios? And just you know, do one of those sooner and see how much you can come up there. I don't know. You guys have been talking about it for 10 years. That's a lot of brownies. I have. <laughs> That's a lot of brownies and cupcakes. The city is, is I'll buy some, but. The city is too busy yeah. wasting money. Okay, folks, we're, we're running out of time. <laughs> there was one more so, question in the back. I'll say one thing. Uh, you know, what happened in Columbine couldn't happen there. What happened in Sandy Hook? couldn't happen there. What happened in Jonesboro couldn't happen there. So this couldn't possibly happen in Hot Springs. Are you willing to take that chance? And are you willing to risk that for the citizens and for your children? Well, all I can tell you is uh, you guys have to make that decision, right? And you do have input. You do have input. Don't forget, even if it's not on the ballot, you know the names of all the people that I work for, and you know how to get a hold of them, right? Yeah, so you can, just, we're here tonight. So. And we're here tonight. You know, we, and if you guys, you know, a lot of times when I hear something like this, I'll, I'll, it'll take me a few days, and I'll say, well, wait a minute, what about that? What about this? So please let us know if you have ideas or thoughts or concerns. We're, we're just trying to hear to solve a problem. That's our job. Okay, I will never get a chance to cut 
David off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I do want to say, Mike McCormick, uh, please share. There may be a lot of complicated issues with the radio system, but one issue that is not complicated, I don't believe any reasonable person would disagree with that city needs a new radio system. I mean, the county's in the same boat. Yeah. The interoperability is critical, not just between city and county, but between city, county, state, park service, so, and we've talked about this in the past. They need to tie together on some level where we can all communicate. Okay, okay. Uh, last, last comment, Rick. I'll just say, David and I had a, had a lot of conversations together, and it, this, is, this is such a better relationship than what we've been through. I think that both of us are going to look at all possible options, and we're working right now with Bo and, and they win and we're working. Different yeah. options there, and we're going to look at the numbers and what's best for, for everyone. So we will see how this comes out. We still have a lot of things to gather. Okay. So we'll Judge, have y'all looked at the Samsung 7 yet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. Uh, I didn't know you were that good at comedy. That's good. <laughs> I got a, got a job opening. Um, thank, thank you, gentlemen, for coming up. Okay, Bob would like to say a closing remark. I'm just going to point out that next month our agenda is going to be primarily the water issue. And hopefully you fellows will <laughs> be back again, right? You sister. Fantastic. So we have a commitment from the city manager and hopefully he'll bring Mr. Burrow and others and we will see where we are and where we're going relative to water and other issues concerning the city. We thank all of you for participating. We thank all of you for coming. Go out and enjoy the night. It's not raining and it's supposed to. Thank you. I already do that. Hey, hey, do it. Good to see you. Good job. Yeah, good to see you. Oh, we're taking these up.